Introduction to Logic. What I'd like to do at the beginning is give you basically an introduction to the introduction of logic and talk about a little bit about what we're going to be doing the entire semester. So we're going to be talking about what logic is, why you might want to take logic, and then what some of the basic principles are in this first section. So the first question might be why study logic? Of course, for many of you, this is a very simple question. Um, it's fulfilling a university requirement. Um, but there's other very good reasons to study logic. One is to learn um, correct reasoning and the ability to follow long chains of reasoning. So logic is about arguments. It's about being able to follow an argument and determine whether that argument is good or bad, whether someone's actually made their case or not made their case. Another reason you might take it, and slightly more practical reason, is because it can help to improve your GRE, MCAT, or LSAT scores. So just studying logic, training in logic, can help you when you come to those standardized tests which have a logical component to them. So there's any number of reasons why you're taking it. Again, I recognize that many of you are probably taking this as a requirement, but still I think there's um, immense value in studying logic. So what is logic all about? Well, logic is, as I said, about arguments. And it's concerned with the types of arguments we have that are sort of formal. So we're not talking about arguments um, like those one might have with a friend or a family where this yelling or screaming match. So normally when we hear about arguments, we have this sort of negative image. But all an argument is, is a set of sentences consisting of one or more premises which contain the evidence and a conclusion which is supposed to follow from those premises. So I give you a number of premises where I said um, X and Y and Z all lead to this conclusion. So if we take these, then we get this conclusion. Now the, the challenge is, of course, is determining whether or not X, Y, and Z actually do lead to that conclusion. How do we know whether the um, chain of inferences, you might say, are actually good? And that's part of what we're supposed to be doing here in logic, is we're going to be able to determine whether an argument is good or bad, or as we're going to say valid or invalid. So the purpose of logic, as I've already said, is to determine which arguments are good or bad, correct or incorrect, valid or invalid. And these terms, by the way, have a very specific meaning. So when we start talking about valid and invalid arguments, in logic, we have a very um, specific meaning that often is um, different from our sort of everyday use of those terms. So a valid deductive argument is one in which the truth of the premises absolutely guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Now when I say it absolutely guarantees, it means that nothing else could follow but that conclusion. So for it to be a valid deductive argument, um, there's a certain necessity in the conclusion. So if I say to you, for example, take the, the whole sentence, I have a dog and I have a cat. That's my premise. Let's think of a very simple argument where I say, I have a dog and I have a cat. There's my premise. What can you conclude from that? Well, you might say, well, you have a dog and a cat. Yes, that's true. But if I take that combined statement, I have a dog and a cat, you can conclude at least one thing that I have a dog, right? So assuming that what I've told you is true, that I'm not lying about having these two pets, what logically follows? Well, I have a dog follows. And the second thing that might follow is I have a cat. So from that one sentence, I know that necessarily it's the case that I have a dog and it's necessarily the case that I have a cat, assuming, of course, that my initial premise is true, which we do in logic. We often assume the truth of the premises um, and then ask whether or not a particular conclusion follows from those premises. Now, notice what you can't conclude from that very simple statement. So if I say I have a dog and a cat, sometimes you might want to say, oh, you must like animals. That might be the conclusion you make. Well, that's not actually a valid deductive argument. If all the information you have about me is that I have a dog and I have a cat, that one compound statement, then you can't infer that I actually like animals. It might be that I hate animals. It might be that my wife or my daughter or my son or someone, they actually like the animals. We have them because they like them, but not because I like them. So notice that in a valid deductive inference, the truth of the premise guarantees the truth of the conclusion. But oftentimes we use it, oh, that's a valid inference. Well, no, actually it's not. Now you might say it's probably the case that I like animals if I have multiple animals in particular. But even that is something you can't be 100% sure of. There's no necessity in that. So all you have 
all you can infer from something as simple as that statement is I have a dog and a cat is I have a dog and I have a cat. So let's look at a few example arguments. Take the following. Let's say I said to you that if you study for the exam, then you will pass. Second premise is you did not study, therefore you did not pass the exam. So the question is, is this a valid or invalid argument? So if we think about this, assuming this is true, the first premise, if you study for the exam, then you'll pass. Assume it's true that you did not study for the exam. Does the following follow? And it turns out that when we look at this, then we look at whether or not this is a valid or invalid argument, that it is an invalid argument. And there's a question, why is this an invalid argument? Well, in part, it's because when we're talking about logic, we're talking about the necessity of the conclusion following from the premises. So even if it's true that if you study, then you'll pass. So assume that that's true, that generally speaking, if you put the time in and you study and you review the material and you read and so forth, that that's what it takes to pass an exam. Assume though that you didn't study. Does it necessarily follow that you would have failed the exam? Well, it doesn't necessarily follow. It's easy to show. For example, you might have come to class every day. You might have, um, you might already know the material. And so when you go, when you go to take the exam, turns out that even if you didn't study, you still passed. So there's nothing, nothing necessitating that's the case. Now, it's probably the case that if you don't study, you're not going to pass. That's true. But do the first two premises. So if I look at these first two premises here, if those two things are true, is it still possible for this conclusion to be false? And then when I say false in this case, it means you actually passed. And yes, it's still possible. So let's take another example. If you study for the exam, then you will pass. You did study for the exam, therefore you pass the exam. Now take a minute and think about this. Assume the first one is true. Assume the second premise is true. Does the third one necessarily follow? Could you get anything else if you just looked at those two premises and assumed their truth, would anything else follow? And in this case, it would be a valid argument. Now again, look at Notice the difference. This simply says, if you do this thing, you study, then this will follow. You do do this, this first part here, therefore you pass. And so necessarily it is the case that if you study for the exam, then you'll pass. You did study, therefore you pass. This is a valid argument. In other words, nothing else could possibly follow from those premises. So it has this Again, this valid argument form. Now I want to sort of note a difference here. For this, for the purposes of this course, we're going to be talking about it about deductive logic. But we should make the distinction between deductive and inductive logic. Induction is different in that the premises don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion, it just makes it highly likely. So in deductive arguments, like the ones we've shown, if you study, then you'll pass that kind of example. Or in the case of, I have a dog and a cat, then necessarily I have a dog. Those necessarily follow. Um, in an inductive argument, there's only probable support for the conclusion. So there's, in an inductive argument, there's a good chance that the conclusion follows, but it's not 100% certain. So let's take a deductive argument. Either you will pass logic or you will fail. You did not fail logic, therefore you pass logic. Now, if we look at this argument, notice that if I assume these premises are true, and again, I emphasize this over and over again because in deductive logic, we assume the premises are true and then ask whether or not the conclusion follows. Either you will pass or you will fail. That seems pretty clear. It's gonna be one or the other. If you did not fail logic, then what necessarily follows? Well, if it's only one of two options, if you can either pass a class or you fail a class, then it seems that necessarily three follows. Therefore, you must have passed logic. So in this case, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Right? There's no other thing that could possibly follow from that, assuming just those two premises. Now, again, in logic, we're looking just at what is given to us in the premises. It's not things that we're necessarily bringing into
the argument. Either you'll pass or you'll fail. You did not fail. Again, in this case, it's difficult to see how anything else could possibly follow or what else you could bring in that would not that would make this somehow different. But for our purposes here, we'll say, yes, this is, in fact, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Now let's take a look at an inductive argument. Students who study tend to score 80% or higher in 95% of their exams. Nicholas studied for all of his exams, therefore Nicholas scored 80% or higher on 95% of his exams. Now if we look at this, you say, does this conclusion necessarily follow from the premises? Well, I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't necessarily follow. So if I say students who study tend to score an 80% or higher on 95% of their exams, what that means is students who study tend to score 80% on 95% of the exams, but notice there's still 5% where that might not be the case. In other words, it might be higher, it might be lower than that. Assuming that Nicholas studied for all his exams, there's a good chance, noting that, again, assuming what we mean by studying, you know, took the time, read the book, tried problems, and so forth, then it would seem to see it would seem to indicate that Nicholas has a good chance or a high probability of scoring 80% or higher in 95% of his exams, but it's not 100% certain. It only just makes it far more likely. So an inductive argument um, is either stronger or weaker. So where, deductive, where a deductive argument is either valid or invalid, an inductive argument is strong or weak. And it's stronger the more the premises sort of give a higher probability of the conclusion actually being true. Now, we tend to use inductive arguments a lot in sciences, for example. Right? So in things where we look at regularity in nature, or regularity in statistics or numbers, these are when we're making inductive inferences. In this course, again, we'll be looking at deductive arguments, ones in which we assume the truth of the premises already, and then we've asked whether or not the conclusion follows. Now, what you might have noticed is that some of these arguments, it's the form of the argument, not necessarily the content in a deductive argument that actually matters. So in a valid deductive argument, there's no way that the premises can be all true and the conclusion false, right? So remember, we say that we mean that you can have true premise, true premise leading to a false conclusion. If you have this situation, then you have an invalid argument. So in this, an argument is invalid, and this is normally the way we talk are about arguments. And arguments are invalid if it's possible for the premises all to be true and the conclusion false. All right. So say that it is possible or impossible is simply to say that it has a certain form. To have a true premise and a false conclusion is a question of the form of the argument. So I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by valid argument form. Now, it'll become clear as we go along in the course, as we sort of give you some valid argument forms, that you'll start to see um, just exactly what this means. And some of it's very easy to recognize. Again, if I go back to that very simple example, I have a dog and I have a cat. What can you deductively infer from that? I've got a dog. What else can you deductively infer? I've got a cat. In that case, any conjunction, if we assume it's true, then we know at least each of the parts of the conjunction. The and statement is true. So if I say I have an alien in my basement and I have a dog, and I, you assume that premise is true, then you can logically infer, oh, he has an alien in his basement. And that's a valid deductive argument. Now, it's sort of a silly argument, but notice the form of the argument. If we assume the premise is true, that's a one, so that we have a one-line proof here, a single statement, then it's also true that I have a dog. So I have a dog and I have an alien in my basement. Again, ridiculous, maybe, but it's these forms that, that allow us to make these deductive inferences. Now, again, there's that difference between validity and soundness. You can have a valid argument in which the premises aren't in fact true, but you could say, well, if it were true, if that statement was true, that and statement, that conjunction was true, then it would follow that I have an alien living in my basement. So let's take another example of form and validity, one that we've used, and you, you've seen. Um, either I will have Chinese for dinner or Italian. Right? So I have Chinese or Italian. It's going to be one or the other. If I then came and said to you, or you said to me, so did you have um, Chinese for dinner? I said, well, I didn't have Chinese for dinner. Well, what would you logically infer? Well, you'd be able to logically infer that I had Italian, right? Assuming that I'm not lying to you. So assuming I didn't go out and get Thai food or something. You say, well, you said it was going to be one or the other. It was not one of them. 
therefore it must have been the other one. And this would be a, this is where the form of the argument actually matters more than the content. Because notice that this form can be applied to just about anything, right? Another example, if Bill Clinton was president in 1993, then Al Gore was vice president in 1993. Al Gore was vice president in 1993, therefore Bill Clinton was president in 1993. Now, we want to ask ourselves, is, it, is this form of an argument a valid form? And it turns out that this is not a valid form. So if Bill Clinton was president, it's an if-then statement, right? So we have if Bill Clinton was president, then Al Gore was vice president. Al Gore was vice president. Now, does this form guarantee, if you have something that follows this structure, is this conclusion that Bill Clinton was president actually follow? Well, this statement could be true. So let's say if Bill Clinton was president, let's assume Bill Clinton was president in 1993, he was, and Al Gore was president. So we know that statement is true. We know Al Gore was vice president in 1993. Does it follow then from those two that Bill Clinton was president. Not whether or not Bill Clinton was, but just by looking at that form, does that guarantee this follows? And it turns out it doesn't. Why? Because it's possible for Al Gore to be vice president to a different president. So if the first one was true and the second one was true, that doesn't imply that Bill Clinton was president. Those premises might stand on their own as true. This, is, this one can be true. This one can be true where this could still possibly be false. How could it possibly be false? Simply there's a different president, All right? So in this case, this form does not is not what we call truth preserving. Unlike the previous example in which we do have truth preservation. So a valid argument, argument which has a valid form and a valid argument simply makes the assertion that if the premises are true, then the conclusion will necessarily be true as well. It doesn't state that the premises are in fact true. So that's one of the things we have to keep very clear is that there's a difference between validity and soundness. So soundness, the truth, the premises, in fact, not when we're saying it, we're not assuming truth, but when we're talking about in the real world, the truth of those in the real world is irrelevant to whether or not something logically follows. Because what we're really doing is sort of giving this hypothetical. If this were the case, would this follow from those things? And if it is the case that this follows, then we know we have a we have a valid deductive argument. Now, if it turns out that those premises aren't in fact true, then that's a whole different story, right? That's where we get to the soundness. A sound argument is a valid argument, so it has some valid argument form. In other words, the truth of the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion and the premises are in fact true. Now, this is what most people think of when they say the word valid. When, when people talk about valid arguments, what they're really saying is a sound argument because they don't care if, well, if that was the case. They're saying, no, no, when we're making an argument, um, I want to know that they are in fact true. But notice, it's actually really important to be sure that you actually have a valid argument to begin with. So a lot of discussion or debate really needs to begin with, well, do you even have a valid argument? Forget about whether it is in fact true. So oftentimes we'll do, um, we'll debate things, for example, in politics or economics, right? Well, if interest rates rise and if interest rates rise, then uh, people will borrow less money. If, if borrow, people and companies borrow less money, then less money will be in the economy, which means less people will be hired, which means unemployment will go up. So imagine I gave a sort of argument like that. Well, before I even know whether or not um, a rise in interest rates will actually trigger all those things. In fact, they might say, well, look, is that, does it actually follow? Can you make an actual valid argument that if this, then this, and this actually leads to that conclusion? You say, okay, if those things were true, if the interest rates went up and this happened and this happened, then that would follow. Now, it might turn out that in fact, it's false that interest rates rise or interest rates go down or unemployment doesn't go down even when interest rates go up. So there could be a number of different variations. The argument's still valid if it's the case that rising interest rates lead to people borrowing less money. If that's true, then these other things follow. Now, we don't say anything about what happens if it's not true. All we're saying is if it is true, what would follow logically? And so there's a value in just saying, well, look, if you don't even have a valid argument, why would I even bother listening to you? Forget about whether it in fact happens. 
I want to know that at least the structure of your argument is valid first. And then we can talk about, well, what does in fact happen? Then we can bring data in and look and say, okay, you have a valid argument, but unfortunately it's not sound because that's not ex that didn't happen. That interest rates went up and people ended up borrowing less money. That didn't happen, so therefore um, your argument isn't sound. And again, what we'll be concerned with in this course is simply going to be the validity of the argument. We don't care so much about the truth or falsity, the actual truth or falsity of their premises. So let's do a few more example arguments just to get sort of sense of this. Let's give an argument. So notice we've got the same argument we did before. Either we'll have Chinese for dinner or I'll have Italian. I did not have Chinese for dinner, therefore I had Italian. So to, to notice the form of the argument, um, we can sort of break this down. So let's let's do a little sort of symbolization, a little early symbolization. We'll be do more. We'll do more of this later in the course. So let's see. Um, stand for I will have Chinese for dinner. Now we should notice that when we use capital letters in logic, those are just a shorthand way of writing the complete sentence. They aren't variables. They're actually the sentence just in a shorthand notation. So let's see. Will I have Chinese for dinner? But I will have uh, Italian for dinner. C or I. So if I were sort of symbolize this now, I have C or I. It's not the case that I had I, therefore I have C. Now this form of the argument turns out is valid for all different kinds of arguments. So if I put this into sort of formal notation, this little wedge shape here, that's the or statement. This tilde is the not. So I have just to give, we'll be going over this again in the next chapter. Um, this is the not or the negation. So P or Q, not Q, therefore P. Now it doesn't matter what sentence I substitute in for this. It will always be valid. So if I say to you, um, either I'm going to my office after class or I'm going to the moon. And then you say, did you go to the, your office? Says, no, I didn't go to my office. Then what can you logically infer? So again, if I say I'm going to my office or I'm going to the moon, I didn't go to my office. Therefore, where did I go? Oh, I must have gone to the moon. Now, you might say that's ridiculous. Of course, you can't go to the moon. You don't have access to um, to a, a, a rocket. You don't have any way of getting to the moon. It's crazy. Um, we haven't been in the moon 50 plus years, whatever. But logically speaking, the only thing you can infer, assuming I'm telling you the truth, is that I'm going to my office or I'm going to the moon. I didn't go to my office, therefore I must have gone to the moon. That's a valid form. And notice you can fit, you can sort of any or statement in which you negate one of the two sides of the disjunct, we call it or statement is a disjunction. Anytime you negate one, you get the other. So I could say, I could change the food that I'm going to eat, where I'm going to go, but any or statement will follow that same pattern. Either I'm going to buy a dog or I'm going to buy a cat. I didn't buy a cat, therefore it follows I bought a dog. Either I'm going to Mars after class or I'm going to the library. I didn't go to the library, therefore I went to Mars. So regardless of what sentences you fill in, so now when we use lowercase letters, I should note, lowercase letters are just placeholders for any sentence. So any you fill in any or set statement you want in there for P, any statement for Q, connect them with the or, and this form will give you a valid argument. Again, remember we said over and over, assuming the premises are true. Now, if I had some magical way of getting to the moon or to Mars or something like that, um, then maybe the statement would be true in fact. But we don't really care about that. All we care about is if that statement were true somehow, then what would follow from the premises given? So this is one very common logical argument form, and we'll be talking about um, this as we go along. This is called. This is just to give you a heads up. It's sort of. A, it's called a disjunctive syllogism. Let's have another argument. If Barack Obama was president in two thousand nine, then Joe Biden was vice president in two thousand nine. Joe Biden was vice president in 2009, therefore Barack Obama was president in 2009. Now notice this argument form looks a lot like the Bill Clinton Al Gore um, argument. You say, well, if Barack Obama was president, then Joe Biden was vice president, Joe Biden was vice president. Is this a valid argument form? Well, just like the other example, this doesn't actually, premise one and premise two, does not necessarily entail premise three. 
right? Because again, it could be true. The first could be true. The second can be true on its own and the third can be false, All right? So this doesn't guarantee, I mean, it's, it's possible. Of course, this is the, this, or this was the case I should say. So yes, it turns out premise one, premise two, and premise three turn out to be true, but it's not necessarily true. In other words, one and two doesn't guarantee the truth of premise three, or I should say the conclusion three. So again, this follows that a different argument form. So if I symbolize this, again, using capital letters to symbolize the simple sentences, Barack Obama was president, Joe Biden was vice president. If B, then A, A, therefore B. Now this argument form we see over and over, a lot of times in very bad arguments, um, to the point where it's been sort of given its own name, sort of a modus moron is what it's is what we actually refer to this. This argument form is not a valid form. So if I, again, put this in a symbol, this is the horseshoe statement, which we call the conditional. Again, we'll be learning these as we go along. So if P then Q, if something has a horseshoe statement, an if then statement, and the consequent, the Q, the second part is restated, then this follows, this is not a valid argument form. It is still possible for the premises to all be true and the conclusion false at the same time. And we'll show various ways of sort of proving this. We'll do this with um, truth tables, and eventually we'll do this um, with our natural deduction, which we'll talk, which again, will come later in the course. So here's another example. If Ontario is the 51st state, then John Kasich was governor of Ohio. John Kasich was governor of Ohio, therefore Ontario is the 51st state. Now this one seems a little bit easier to see, but you say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. If Ontario was the 51st state, then John Kasich was governor of Ontario. So this is a conditional, if it was, then Kasich was governor, Kasich was governor. Does that mean Ontario is the 51st state? Uh, no, nope. it has that same bad form that we, that we showed before. So it turns out that from one and two, we can't infer, deductively infer, three. This just follows that bad argument form. Now, we won't concern ourselves with bad argument forms. There are a lot of bad arguments. What we're going to do is give you a set of rules, well, actually sort of eight basic rules, that will um, show you what good argument forms look like. And so there's eight basic ones in which we can construct a whole bunch more. But we're not going to actually go over poor argument forms just to note that if we were to symbolize this and then apply what we're going to learn in the class. So again, here's the symbolization. If oh, um, Ontario is the 51st state, then um, Kasich was governor of Ohio. H is true. Therefore, O, which is, again, a false statement. So it's true, true, false. So all of these, you'll notice have this in, in terms of this bad argument form, the modus moron that I've that I mentioned. So it's the same form as the Obama Biden, same form as the Gore, Clinton Gore, and the Ontario and the Kasich argument. All of these share a common form that doesn't guarantee that is not what we call truth preserving, right? The truth of the premises doesn't guarantee or lead to the truth of the conclusion. So this is the sort of counterexample that shows us why these things don't work. So again, you don't have to worry about this. This is just sort of a, again, this is something sort of a mention to note that there are just very bad argument forms that we are often repeat bad arguments over and over. And you'll see these structures at times, um, reading editorial pages or people making arguments that actually use this kind of form. And what hopefully in this class we'll be able to do is show you how to pick out which argument forms are good and then noting which ones are bad. Or if you write down the argument and symbolize it, you'll be able to recognize, ah, that's a bad argument. Here's where they've made their mistake. That isn't a valid argument form. That doesn't follow from those premises.